Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast, episode number 310. The most common prostate cancer screening method is obsolete. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at Biobalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Over the last year or two, Dr. Maupin and I have done a couple of podcasts, uh, health casts, on prostate cancer, prostate screening, prostate issues. There continue to be newer research presentations, more information obtained uh, that, that require us to come back and revisit conversations about prostate exams for men. As men age, their prostates enlarge, uh, and the question of prostate cancer arises. It's a very serious concern. About 26,000 American men die every year from prostate cancer, mm -hmm. uh, which is significant. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not a number we want to throw away. Uh, but 186,000 men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. So most of those men don't die. Mm -hmm. uh, most of those men never die from prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. They die from other things, partly because they're older uh, and age brings with it its own package of, of issues. And so they're, they die from other things before the prostate cancer can kill them. Mm -hmm. Partly it's because some prostate cancers grow very slowly. And as they grow, the research is showing us they don't really do that much to you. I mean, in terms of sexual function, in terms of survival, in terms of general health. For most of us, for fast-growing cancers, it's a whole different thing. Uh, so we want to talk today about new research that's talking about the DRE, the digital rectal exam, whether it's an efficacious uh, way to determine if somebody has prostate cancer is at risk. We want to talk about the PSA test and whether or not it's an efficacious way to determine if somebody has prostate cancer uh, or if they're at risk. Then we want to talk about if they do have prostate cancers, what are the various recommendations concerning different kinds of, of responses, whether the response is watchful waiting or surgery or radiation. There's data that tells us how people function and survive under all of those uh, or, or doing nothing which is also a possible choice. I choose mm -hmm. not to respond. And so we're going to talk about all of that. But before we do that, we want to put some qualifiers around prostate cancer and the issue of testosterone replacement. So I'm going to have Dr. Moffin speak to that, and then we'll come back and talk about the research that's showing us new information about DREs and PSA tests. So I want, I want this stated up front because we'll be talking about tests that may or may not be as accurate as we once thought. But if someone has elevated PSA and an abnormally large or hard prostate that they know of mm -hmm. and come to see me but have not had a, a biopsy to prove whether they have prostate cancer or not, I'm not going to take the chance to give them testosterone, and no one should. You should be either evaluated for prostate cancer, yes, no, do you have it or not, right. or is it just... Because that structures the, the treatment decisions that you right, make. Right, because testosterone doesn't cause prostate cancer. It just doesn't cause it. But once you have prostate cancer, it could make it grow quickly. Just like some breast cancers are... Stim not breast, breast doesn't, isn't caused by estrogen, but breast cancers are stimulated. Some breast cancers are stimulated by estrogen. Mm -hmm. Some are not. There are some prostate cancers that are stimulated by testosterone, and there are some that aren't. So we need I'm, to know what we're dealing with. I need to know before I give someone testosterone right. whether they have cancer or not, and if they do, is it stimulated by testosterone? And that test is still in the is in the works. Right. So that that's kind of my disclaimer. We're not going to be talking about uh, giving testosterone to people who have unknown prostate cancer, right. you know, oh, I'm going to get it. I, my uh, PSA went up, but I don't, I don't want to think about it. So I'm not going to get any more tests, but I want testosterone. That's not going to happen because I don't want to do any harm. Right. 
So you have a standard protocol. And your response right. to people is, you we need to have you evaluated and see if you have prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Period. We we won't continue the conversation. That's a urologic that one. problem. Right. Uh, you not, go to a urologist right. to get a biopsy or to get other testing to see whether you have prostate cancer or not. So uh, on your checklist. Do you have prostate cancer? Have you had an exam? Have you had a PSA? Have you been diagnosed? And if the answer to that is, yes, I've had these, I've not been diagnosed, I'm, I'm clear, then we have one branching path mm -hmm. that we go down. The answer is, yes, I've had these, I do have cancer, then we have another mm -hmm. branch. And if the third answer is, no, I haven't been evaluated, then your response is full stop. We're not going to do any more until you mm -hmm. are evaluated. Absolutely, and and we it's know it's irresponsible to do anything else about replacing hormones. Well, there are certain standards of care that we have to follow, and that is one of them. Yes. Someday, and at, at the end of all of this, my call to action is: let's find a test that's really accurate, right? For this, that doesn't involve always being biopsied and pain and and the misery that you have to go through there. A more radiologic test that we can use to figure out if you really have prostate cancer or not. So the data on that, the talking about PSA mm -hmm. tests, not not DREs. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. DRE is a digital rectal exam. You go to the physician or the nurse practitioner, whoever's examining you, they put a rubber glove on their hands, they grease them up and they insert their <laughs> finger in your anus. And so right. and they feel your prostate. And based on what they feel, they make a an informed opinion, a judgment. This feels enlarged, this feels rough and bumpy. Uh, I'm worried that you may have cancer. Let's go to plan B. Plan B is a PSA test, a blood mm -hmm. test, where they can me measure your prostate-specific antigens that are in the blood. The problem with that is 17 to 50%, which is a huge, a huge amount, range. are false positives. Meaning? Meaning they say they're they positive. They say you got it, but you, but don't. you don't. Yeah. So then a man gets a diagnosis. You know what? You got uh, prostate cancer because your prostate your PSA count is over the top. It's jumped way up. Now we think you have it. We think you have it. So now we need to do biopsy. So then they have to go in and take a piece of it and send it to the lab and say, is this cancerous? Mm -hmm. And they try to take a piece that's in the area where they felt the roughness or in the area. I don't, I don't know. It's, they, through the, it's through the penis. It's not through the rectum. Okay. And so that I'm wrong on that. I yeah. haven't had one of those. So yeah, and so so they're using a scope and a little a little thing to biopsy with. And, and, and is that painful? Yeah. Okay. So, yes, it <laughs> well, is. Well, so but biopsies. That's, yeah. Lots of things are painful. Right. Cervical biopsies are painful for women, and we still do them. We, mm. I mean, you can use lidocaine. Women are just can, tougher. Yeah, we are. I mean, you talk to a man about sticking something down his penis and, and biting off a piece of what's inside his middle. <laughs> It causes him to get concerned. I know. I know. I mean, we have... And DREs, digital rectal exams. Over a third of the men out there say, I don't get them because it's uncomfortable. It's physically Tough. uncomfortable. I won't make We've been point, getting man. vaginal... You, when women go... Now I don't you're know being, if everybody now knows you're being this. sexist. Yes, I I'm am. I'm trying to talk about sensitive men with sensitive issues. I, I understand that. Sensitive women... And you're just women, discounting that. Women, it doesn't matter how sensitive we are. We still... We're 16 or 18. <laughs> we got to go in for a pelvic exam and we got to do that. Until we're 80. I mean, we, that means somebody puts in a large instrument into a small vagina and looks at the cervix, biopsy, not biopsies it, but paps it, and then has to squeeze on the uterus and ovaries and do a rectal. That's not fun. So that's what we do every year. So I'm not really feeling sorry for you. I mean, I, I don't know, think I there's, that. there's there's not a good reason yeah. for some for somebody to be afraid of having a rectal exam. Well, it's less painful than dying. It is. So if it's a serious risk that you may die, and there's questions about that with prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. There are men who die from it. And for those men and their families, it's a horrible, horrible thing. And and the treatments for trying to survive it are not are awfully good. Not good. Really and, and difficult. The, the impact of the radiation or the surgery can cause so many additional complications. Even if you're going to die from prostate cancer, I personally would say you need to talk to your doctor about the side effects of the treatments because if being incontinent, if not being able to, to function sexually, if uh, being in pain or concerns that you have. It also can cause uh, bowel uh, if you get radiation as a treatment, yeah. it can actually kind of cook the bowel so it's scarred so your bowels don't work properly either. 
So, so then do you need a colostomy bag or do you just have different? Sometimes, going or you're just incontinent of stool, which is a whole nother thing. I mean, are you telling us it, it depends? Absolutely. <laughs> but this is the one thing I don't want to do is scare people away from being having their life saved. No, I just you're think there should be. You're making a very be, strong point that they need to have it anyway, whether it's uncomfortable or a right. concern. Right. If the they have, is, how do we decide what's fast acting? We don't have a good way to do. That. We don't know that. So then the question becomes: A, do you have the exams? Do you trust the exams? Do you have a biopsy? Do you trust the biopsy? Then B, what do you do? What treatments are considered? Let, let me read some of the statistics. We, this information was put out in an article in the Huffington Post, which we'll, we'll post on our website. Uh, the title of it is, The Most Common Prostate Cancer Screening Method is Obsolete. And they're talking about the DRE, the digital rectal exam, is at least a once a year thing that most men experience after a certain age, say 40. Their doctors start doing that as a standard of care perception. Mm -hmm. What the research is now saying is that isn't necessarily standard of care because it doesn't necessarily tell us anything. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of men avoid it because they're not comfortable mm -hmm. with it. So then the next step, standard of care, is a PSA test. So you get a blood test and they do a PSA screening. And they say, oh, here's what's going on with you. Uh, but as much as 50% of those are inaccurate. So then you don't know if you have it or not. So you have to mm -hmm. think about maybe a biopsy. And it hasn't been until recently that doctors have been saying as loudly as they have been, at least to my knowledge, that as men age, their PSA count goes up anyway and their prostate gets enlarged. Mm -hmm. So those are standards of age development and not indicators of cancer. Mm -hmm. So the question about prostate is a legitimate question because it's a real cancer and you can die. But how do you know? And, and that's what's fascinating. Let me read you some statistics that come from this article and we'll, we'll post the article itself. It was from a study at Wake Forest. Study at Wake Forest. Uh, 38,000 men were studied. Right. For And it's a 10-year study. Here's, here's what I want. Okay. An estimated, they said they follow these men for 10 years. 98.5% of them survived 10 years or more. So now they're saying, well, maybe the critical window is 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. So they're waiting for that period to pass to see if the data drops significantly. Mm -hmm. But the life expectancy after cancer diagnosis for 98.5% of the men that have been diagnosed is they're going to stay alive. Mm-hmm. With right. or without treatment. With or without treatment. With or without treatment. So they go on to say uh, there's almost a 100% five-year survival rate, a 98% 10-year survival rate, and a 95% 15-year survival rate. Mm -hmm. uh, while some men will die of prostate cancer, there are documented risks and harms that show widespread regular prostate cancer screening may not be the best policy for, for most men. An estimated five in 1,000 men will die of prostate cancer without getting screening. So if you just don't get a screening, there's a risk of, of five in a thousand mm -hmm. that you'll die. If you do get a screening, if you do, if you're good about it, if your wife harasses you, your doctor mm -hmm. harasses you, we gotta know, get in there, don't be a sissy, get your mm -hmm. exam. Four in a thousand will die if they got screenings. Not so five in a thousand die without screening, Four in a thousand die with screening. It doesn't seem to make it a good case to. for screening. Yes. But, I, and shoot, you know, so, that's so they go on to say, way less than 1%. This means that screening will at most save the life of one man in a thousand while causing false positives in up to 120 men in a thousand. About 110 men in 1,000 will go on to be diagnosed with prostate cancer, and of these, about 90% will choose treatment that could cause serious cardiovascular events, deep venous thrombosis, urinary incontinence, erectile dysfunction, and death. So you can die of the treatment, or you can be made so freaking miserable from the treatment that you might, given full information and informed consent concepts, choose not to get the treatment. So mm -hmm. it's a personal decision. You and your family need, and, and your physician, mm -hmm. all together need to make the decision, what are you going to do about prostate cancer in your life? Are you going to get tested to see if you have it or if you're at risk for it? If you get the test, are you going to believe that they're 
valid, that they're accurate. If you believe that they're valid and accurate, then you have to make treatment choices. If you get a choice of radiation, if you get a choice, you can burn your bowels and have a problem. And your bladder and your bladder and, and so your system won't work. Uh, for many, not all. Mm -hmm. Or you can have surgery. The side effects of surgery are also pretty devastating for m many men. I wouldn't say most, but many. Impotence uh, and incontinence. Impotence, incontinence. And so your sex life is over. And mm -hmm. you're going to be wetting yourself all the time because you don't have any control. When you cough, when you sneeze, you're going to have leakage issues constantly. There are factors of miserableness that you need to anticipate, but always remembering that dying of cancer is miserable. So, mm -hmm. but at, I'm 70 years old, 69. If I got a cancer diagnosis, according to these statistics, I'm going to live to be 79. Mm -hmm. and there's a 100% chance that I'll live five years, a 98% chance that I'll live 10 years, uh, a 95% chance that I'll live 15 years with cancer. So in the next 15 years, the odds are something else is going to kill me. Mm -hmm. So I would really have to have a conversation with my wife and my physician about the quality of life as I age, as I deteriorate, and as I face death. That's what we want you to know. The, don't panic. Don't avoid. Don't bury your head in the sand in ignorance. Don't panic and rush into a treatment. Don't panic in, in response to a diagnosis. The data on this topic is so unrefined, so imprecise, so unknown still, that you really have to pay your money and take your choice. You've got to live with the consequences one way or the other. It's a life, quality of life threatening decision. Once, most, once cancer is diagnosed, and if you choose not to have treatment, it right. doesn't mean you just go, oh, I'm not going to the doctor anymore. Right. It's an option. You still have to monitor because once you have cancer, it is important whether your prostate gets larger and larger. It is important if your PSA goes up higher and higher. And there may be more biopsies in your future. But if you do research on it, what, what the research tells you is when you're younger, it's more significant because they mm -hmm. will push you harder to do some of the treatments. Because it's, it grows faster when you're younger. It, absolutely. Be, everything grows. Every cancer seems to grow faster when we're younger. But I've reached the age. And to Lucky my, you. To my sadness uh, in one respect, I reached the age where they say, you know, you're on the bubble. And might help you, might not. We're mm -hmm. not sure we would recommend that you do anything mm -hmm. at your age. But if I was 45 or 55 mm -hmm. or 60 or even 65, mm -hmm. they would still say, you really need to think hard about what you want to do here because the alternative choices are serious and flawed in almost every domain. But it's reality and you have to face it. So when you hit a certain age and they start to say, well, you know what, you're going to die from something else anyway. I wouldn't worry about it. Just some, some of us you know, live to 100. Clean up your now. business, yeah. <laughs> but th there, there's another thought. I mean, yeah, you have to look at that as you have a 10-year window, 15-year window. Mm -hmm. But I really think that in the next 10 years, there will be a test, whether it be a radiologic test, not a test that is invasive and painful. But we, we have begun in gynecology to use ultrasounds right. very commonly to decide whether we're going to do surgery on somebody, whether it's whether they have uterine cancer, whether they have ovarian cancer, whether and it, it isn't radiation, it's just ultrasound, and we can get a good picture of that. The, foul, the problem with doing that ultrasound for men is that for women, we have a vagina, we can look through the vagina and do all that. Right. Well, to get into... You uh, put the probe there the, to you see put a pro, You put a long probe, a phallic-looking probe, into the vagina and look around for the best picture. For men, you have to put that probe up the rectum. Right. They don't like that, obviously. It's not fun. We don't really like getting the uh, ultrasound either. It's a little bit... It's not painful. It's just uncomfortable. Right. But it's a way of of evaluating the prostate and seeing if there's any abnormalities that could be a cancer growing. Right. That's, they're going to come up with something more, more like a 3D ultrasound, which we do on babies. So there's there has so to the be a way to do that. It's improving. But there'll be mm -hmm. ways to evaluate the prostate more effectively as we go. We just haven't done that because we thought the 
the rectal exam plus a PSA was adequate. Well, now we know it's not. Well, and there's a new blood test that they're promoting, that they're mm -hmm. doing research on, and it's out and it's available, and they say it is a better thing. It gives a more qualitative result than the traditional PSA mm -hmm. blood test. It's still not definitive. It's still not definitive. It just says, but, here's but your the, risk. But your point is the technology is changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it puts you in a risk category. You're at moderate risk, you're at a medium risk, you're at a high risk. doesn't so, tell you how fast it's going to grow. or Well, but that tells you then that you need to evaluate the risk mm -hmm. to determine if you need a biopsy. So the, Yeah, so the I next mean, so, step is So the question then is, is continue to be involved in, the, uh, in a participatory way with the evaluation of what kind of testing and care you're going to receive. Don't bury your head in the sand. And don't just say, oh, yeah, then I'm getting a prostatectomy. It'll be great. Right. Yeah. I mean, honestly, a hysterectomy is not devastating, except for, like, your ovaries being removed. But taking a uterus out, which is kind of a similar procedure as a prostatectomy, right. is, you know, the uterus really doesn't, it's not so tightly involved with your colon and your bladder that it would it would be damaging. But... But a prostate is. It's yeah. surrounding the urethra. and The microsurgery that's involved in that mm -hmm. is so susceptible to doing damage. Mm -hmm. The nerves for the for erections Nerve are Nerve damage, tissue damage, bladder damage. I mean, there are a lot of ways it can mess you so up. So it's, it's not really equivalent in terms of risk or, yeah, let's just take it out. I mean, yeah. you can't really make that decision that lightly. You have to really think about what the risks are, what the benefits are. It's like one of my uh, patients had was told she needed chemo for breast cancer. And she right. looked at, and she said to her doctor, so how much does that improve, the real question, how much does that improve my my um, survival? And she said 0.1%. Right. So then well, why would you spend all that money and go through all that agony and fret about all those issues? But what's my chance of, what's my, she gave her another number. I don't have the not, another number in my head, but of what the chances are of getting another cancer because she had chemotherapy for this, and it was really high. So that's an easy that's an easy decision. Right, right. But in 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 this case, when you look at the numbers, it becomes a little easier for most of us, or most men, uh, us as a like a couple, to make a decision about that. And you should make it with your your uh, partner because it involves them as well. Right. So. We will continue to update you as we uh, acquire uh, new information regarding prostate, prostate cancer, prostate exams, because as Kathy said, it is a, a, a significant issue about which the technology and knowledge base is changing almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So you just want us to, to be aware. You want to not panic, consider your options, discuss it with your partner and discuss it with your physician, but educate yourself about it. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk to you about it again. Mm -hmm. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.